Good morning. Welcome and greetings as we gather to worship and be the people of God together. Uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, also, I want to welcome, of course, those who are joining us by video. We hope you feel very much a part of this and experience God's presence wherever you are. Uh, we have uh, purple boxes at each of the aisles. Those are for your offerings, and so we're not going to pass a plate. And then also, there should be a little slip of paper in your bulletin. If you'd please register your presence with us, that'll go into the box, and that way, if we have to get hold of you, we are able to. We also use that for the prayer chain, and if you hit the little box that says private, then it just goes to me and just, I'm, well, it's private to me at least. Uh, following the worship service, we're going to have a fellowship time. It's out in the courtyard, and we're going to honor the faithfulness and the patience of this congregation. <laughs> um, also, there is some very, a couple of special cakes, and so I do hope you'll join us. Following that, there will be a sermon discussion in the library, and you're welcome to come and correct my theology. Uh, Beth. Good morning. Oh, two weeks from yesterday, no, yes, two weeks from yesterday, which will be October the 12th, we are having a recital right here in our sanctuary at three o'clock. It's Vicki Kuyper and friends. Holly will be one of her friends. <laughs> I asked Vicki if she only had one friend, and she said, no, I have a pianist too, so it's going to be Vicki and two of her friends. <laughs> it's going to be a lovely chamber recital, and I'll, I'll remind you next week, but it's in two weeks, Saturday the 12th at 3 o'clock. Mr. Craig. Good morning. Do I have any golfers out here? Not too many. Well, you can still help us. What we're doing is I'd like to invite you to a golf tournament for the benefit of the chaplains at the detention center. This is one of their big fundraisers and they do such amazing work bringing hope and salvation to so many inmates each year. The tournament is going to be Monday, October the 7th at 7.30 a.m. I don't know how I'm gonna get up at that early, but. You don't have to be a professional like me to, to come and play, okay? And also, if you'd like to help, but, but you're not a golfer, um, we'd be glad to accept your contributions, and I have invitations for you if you like. Thank you. Let us prepare for worship. There's a meditation at the beginning of our bulletin. Please stand and join me as we call ourselves to worship using the words in your bulletin. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his decrees, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, 
having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. How can young people keep their way pure by guarding it according to your word? Open my eyes so that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous ordinances. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. I revere your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. My lips will pour forth praise because you teach me your statutes. Please pray the prayer of adoration with me. Most holy God of love, we draw near to you with hope and encouragement because of who you are. You have shown us your love, wisdom, power, and goodness in all your works and have revealed your truth in the words of Holy Scripture. We thank you for our Bible its words enlighten our darkness and enable our spirits to soar, embracing the depths of your love. You have caused the inspired words of scripture to be preserved, translated, published, and multiplied so that all may find your truth within. We pray that through our worship, we will be open to your word and spirit. May we be equipped to lead more faithful and useful lives according to your will and purpose. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come before God aware of things within us that we would prefer not to remember, but we cannot forget that have damaged our relationship with God and with other people who are also precious to their Lord and Creator. We confess our failings because we trust in the promises of God's grace through Jesus Christ and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit toward the fullness of life that God intends for us. Please join me in the prayer of confession and the silent meditation that follows. God of light and love, we humble ourselves and ask forgiveness for the wrongs we have done and caused, for the wounds we have inflicted. Sometimes we live in darkness rather than seeing the light of your love for us and for all your children. We have failed to live out your compassion and light to others. Spiritually, our eyes have been closed, and that blindness has caused hurt and harm. In our moments of doubt, give us strength and courage to believe your promises. May we be open to a vision of new possibilities and boldness in a life of faithfulness, integrity, and truthfulness. Holy Jesus, our living hope, may we become more and more responsive to your grace and to your call. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain in us a willing spirit.
Amen. God is gracious and loving. Hear the good news of the gospel, that nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus. In Jesus Christ, all our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. All our sins are forgiven and gone. Amen. What is our only comfort in life and in death? That I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who at the cost of his own blood has fully paid for all my sins and has completely freed me from the dominion of the devil, that he protects me so well that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, everything must fit his purpose for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him.
At this time, I'd like to invite our young disciples, if you'd please join me in the front, and especially those who are going to receive Bibles. Good morning. This is the Bible I received more years ago than I'm willing to admit. Yesterday, when someone saw in the bulletin that we're gonna give out Bibles today, she said, I still have my Bible that I was given all those many years ago. In fact, almost every time we give out Bibles, and present them. Someone who has this color of hair will tell me that they still have theirs. And so these Bibles are really very, very precious. And I'd like to tell you a story that a friend of mine named Mel told me many, many years ago. So he knew he was gonna get his Bible and he was really looking forward to it. His dad happened to be an admiral, and he happened to live on a Navy base. And he was so excited he could barely sleep. That was on December 6th, and he was so excited. Finally fell asleep, and around 7 o'clock in the morning, he woke up to the sound of lots and lots of airplanes passing overhead. And then a little bit later, there were bombs dropping all over the Navy base where they lived. And the ships in the harbor were getting damaged. Very, very scary time. It woke him up like with a start. And he knew he was supposed to get his Bible that day. And so that was really important to him. And it suddenly dawned on him, what if one of those bombs hit the chapel where my Bible is? And he thought, well, you know, that's not going to be good. He already knew church was probably going to be canceled. And so despite all of the bombs exploding and the machine guns and all this other stuff of a war going on, he ran all the way from his house to the chapel to get his Bible. And he sorted through all the other Bibles there, and he found the one with his name in it. Then he ran all the way back. He was so much wanting his Bible that he was willing to run through bombs and machine guns, a war getting started. And in fact, that day, almost 3,000 people got killed in that attack. But his Bible was that important and he really wanted to get it. And of course, Mel still had his Bible when he told me the story. Now, some of you are going to get a Bible today. Pretty exciting. And I want to talk just a little bit about what that is. Because see, This isn't just a single book. It's actually a library of 66 books. And it was written over thousands of years as people described their experiences with God. How they understood God and the stories and the poetry, the commandments. And it's all in here. And for each of you that are being presented Bibles today, I have chosen some particular Bible verses for you. Since I know you, I figured out things that I thought you would like. And I can, for instance, in mine, I still remember my Bible verse. And I have memorized and it's been helpful to me all my life. And so hopefully your Bible verse will be important to you too. And so with great joy, I want to present you with your Bibles. Kendall, you're first. Come on up. You brought your smile, too. That's good. This is your Bible. It is precious as you are. God bless you. you. Morning, Sarah. (laughs) Hell yeah. You're next. This is your Bible. It's precious as you are. God bless you. 
And you know who this one's for? (laughs) This is your Bible. It's precious as you are. God bless you. Let us pray together. Holy and loving God, we are so grateful for the gift of your word. We are also very grateful for those who received their Bibles today. We ask, Lord, that you'll open your word in their lives. May they recognize the preciousness of your love and how special we all are because we are your beloved children. We pray for this church. Help us, Lord, to always be faithful. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessings be with you. Let us pray together. Lord, this is a day of grace and blessings, and we thank you. We praise you for the power and majesty, your love and compassion that surrounds us. We celebrate your gifts and the blessings that fill our lives, and thank you for calling us to discipleship, for sending Jesus to show us how to live and love. Here and now, may we attend to your spirit, to your truth, to the transforming and healing power of your presence so that we will leave this worship walking and serving a little closer with you. We thank you for our church, this family of faith where we grow in our faith through worship, through fellowship, and through Christian service. Help us this day to honor you in our worship, to focus on you and humble ourselves in adoration. We thank you for the gift of Scripture, your written word. We seek your blessings on those who received Bibles today, and may we all seek a closer and deeper walk of faith with you. Holy God, We pray for the harsh situations and circumstances of life, especially where there is difficulty and suffering. For those struggling with an uncertain or difficult future, let your promises and hope be heard afresh. For those wounded and ill, may they receive your healing and comfort. Where relationships are not healthy, where families are struggling, Help us, Lord, to listen. Help us to love and practice forbearance. May we honor you by the way we care and forgive one another. We pray that along our life's journey, please help us be attentive along the way. 
Help us keep our eyes and hearts open along life's path to focus on the truth, on the needs of those around us, and seek to see from your perspective, guided by Scripture. We ask that you'll help us participate and celebrate your healing and your active presence in this world. According to your purpose, grace, and kindness, O oh Lord, may we arrive at our destination with our lives transformed, our hearts enlarged, our relationships improved, and our faith grown deeper. Gracious God, we ask that you'll shake us up today. Disturb us if we won't listen or if we're too proud and stubborn. Hear us, O oh Lord. Help us hear you as we open our hearts and lives before you in the silence of our prayer. Lord God, you are gracious and loving. And for this, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
The first reading this morning is from Romans chapter 14. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also, those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. And while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Let us therefore no longer pass judgment on one another, but resolve instead never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of another. The second reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. <clears throat> John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able to soon afterwards speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, we do thank you, Lord, for your written word, your gifts, all the blessings that fill our days. Help us to hear. Help us to listen and be transformed by your spirit. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Lately, I have been remembering, reflecting, and reevaluating my ministry and truthfully, some decisions I regret and would like a do-over. But one of the better decisions that I think I got just right was when I served a church along the North Carolina coast, and many of our visitors were folks who had weekend beach houses. And since there weren't any Quaker meeting houses in our area, a very faithful family of Quakers found their way to our church. During the mid-1600s, Christians were killing other Christians in terrible and vicious religious wars over faith and doctrine. In England, after four decades of brutal and bloody fighting of Christians slaughtering other believers over religious purity, George Fox rejected all outward religious practices, all of them, hoping to avoid those ongoing conflicts. 
Those who agreed with him and followed were known as Quakers, and they focused on quiet prayer, inner peace, and reflection, rather than performing religious practices and rituals. Baptism practices had been an especially divisive issue. So the Quakers moved to what they called a spiritual baptism, which actually didn't use any water. Eventually, that family of Quakers moved into their beach house full-time, and they got very involved in the life of our congregation, singing in the choir and participating in the activities. They were deeply committed Christians, faithful to Scripture, certainly are fit into our life together at the Presbyterian Church. And over time, I came to truly enjoy, admire, and respect their faithful dedication to the Lord. One evening, Kathy and I were invited to their home to share a meal. And we talked a lot about Quaker beliefs, and being a Presbyterian. And then Bill and Elaine inquired about joining the church. They explained that it was very important for me to understand that they were not rejecting their Quaker faith and traditions but they had experienced a commitment to Jesus Christ, that same commitment, and that our church seemed compatible with their beliefs and faith. Of course, I was delighted that they were going to finally join our church family. I also knew that Quakers stress the work of the Holy Spirit and seeing baptism as entirely spiritual, they don't use any water. And so, does the amount of water used determine the validity of a baptism. Our Presbyterian directory allows some flexibility in worship, but I wasn't sure about a baptism that didn't involve any water. I had never heard of any Presbyterian being dry cleaned. <laughs> now, I knew this family well. The authenticity and the depth of their faith and I actually, I was pretty sure God approved of their waterless baptism, but I wasn't so sure about the Presbyterian church. I asked about getting baptized with water, and they said no, because that would have denied the validity of their Quaker baptism, and understandably, they weren't willing to do that. I also knew that we had a Presbyterian meeting the next day in Wilmington, so I suggested that I would ask wiser and more experienced pastors, and we all agreed that we would each pray and seek further guidance. As it happens, some very respected professors I'd had at seminary, along with these more experienced pastors, were all at the meeting. And I felt much relieved knowing that surely they could guide me. When I describe my waterless baptism and church membership dilemma, the professors agreed that it was certainly a fascinating question. <laughs> and the wiser, more experienced pastors all told me they'd never heard of a Quaker even wanting to join a Presbyterian church before. And they all asked if I'd let them know how I finally worked it out. <laughs> and one of my professors even urged me to write an article about it after I figured it all out and resolved this Quaker baptism question. When I got home that evening, I spent several hours in prayer and careful study. And I eventually recognized that what it came down to was what it means to be a family of faith and a community of grace. And I focused on whether it was more likely that God wanted me to exclude or wanted me to welcome and affirm. In Romans passage, Paul is dealing with a similar issue in question. As the early Christian church grew beyond just Jewish believers, it became increasingly complicated to separate faith from Judaism traditions. And two issues that kept stirring things up for the Christians in Rome had to do with food restrictions and keeping Jewish holy days which are seen very differently and were quite divisive between the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers. 
Now, Paul as a theologian knew that we're saved by grace alone, which meant that the Jewish religious rituals were far less relevant. But Paul was also not willing to let that difference split the church and destroy their unity as a church as in Christ. As Paul explains, loving other Christians and valuing them is far more important than what we eat or don't eat or if we keep the holy days. Salvation is all about God's grace, very little to do with anything we do. And the critical truth is that we are one faith family and that we all now belong to God and not to ourselves. Notice how forcefully Paul writes about this, starting in verse 4. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before our own Lord that they stand or fall. Those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And Paul's point is that if we belong to God and we are the Lord's servants, and then scripture, our conscience, and Christian fellowship all help to guide us. Christians on both sides of the issues were God's own beloved and precious. And the differences dividing them were not the Lord's priority. Verse 10, why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or why do you despise your brother or sister? See, the question is, does it honor God as an expression of our faith? Does it deepen our walk of faith with the Lord? And does it build up the body of Christ, the church? Paul was explaining and insisting to these Christians in Rome that as those united by Christ's death and resurrection, by, by grace we're called to live with our differences for the sake of God's will and Christian community. Now, Paul's perspective raises some very important questions. Do I trust God's power, sovereignty, and wisdom in God's judgment enough to wait and be patient and allow God to work it out? Or am I insisting that I must defend and that I must attack as if the Lord were not capable of fulfilling the divine will? Someone once told me you, define, you defend God the same way you defend a lion. You just open the cage and let it defend itself. It's therefore not our place to criticize God's other servants because we are all God's children saved only by God's gracious love. And we all have the same humble rank in God's household. So who are we to reject who or what God has claimed and approved? The gospel lesson from Mark is, deals with the same issue. Verse 38. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop them because they're not following us. When I read that, I thought, you're not a fireman. How dare you put out that fire and rescue me? You're not a lifeguard. How dare you save me from drowning? You're not one of us. How dare you cast out a demon in the name of Jesus? Jesus disagreed with John. He's willing for good to be done if it's done even by those who are not his recognized followers. Verse 39. But Jesus said, do not stop him. For no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able to soon afterwards speak evil of me. And though he wasn't one of the 12 disciples, he was doing a good deed as an expression of faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 41. For truly, I tell you, whoever gives a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. 
If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. Jesus is using a rhetorical hyperbola to emphasize a point. Even something as minor as a cup of water to drink is welcome, appreciated, and will be rewarded by God. So don't criticize the faith efforts and work of others or cause one of the little ones to stumble a babe in Christ. Truth is, our faith journey is a lifelong process of spiritual development and discernment. And not everyone arrives at the same place at the same time. But since God is sovereign and the Lord is in charge, we are called to trust God's wisdom power to complete fulfillment of God's grace, plan, God's will, and purpose. Criticism and complaint are never an effective motivator. But take away our joy and interfere with God's grace and can do terrible things to our witness and ministry. The question is, what does it mean for Jesus to dwell in and among us and for Jesus Christ to truly be the sovereign Lord of our lives? It means that we let God's grace draw us nearer and deeper and allow God's grace to guide us in building up the body. It is consciously and deliberately living a life of faith that makes more room for God's gracious love. That session in congregation of my church in North Carolina enthusiastically welcomed that Quaker family into membership. And I resisted my inclination to bring along a squirt gun. <laughs> they were a joyful blessing and a wonderful addition to our church family. And in fact, just last week, I saw one of their posts on Facebook. Our call is to accept and trust God and God's gracious purpose, and that not by our own efforts, our Christian service, or good works, are we trying to earn that which delights of the Lord God to give freely. It means trusting God to bring us where we really need to be, by keeping my ego, my ways, and my desire to control from distracting, hindering, or interfering with God's gracious love, God's will and purpose. That same message flows all through the witness of Scripture about God's abiding love shining like a light in this world's darkness, which reaches out with hope to the unworthy, the undeserving which frees us from the pressure of having to make the grade or unending demands for more performance or perfection. Because God's promise, God's grace, love, and hope are freely given without limits, demands, or requirements that we must first fulfill and achieve before God will act on our behalf. When I finally come to my end, and some things I will have gotten right, other decisions in life, I'll have gotten way wrong. But in either case, it will be entirely the grace of God that brings me home. As those united into the one body of Christ by death and resurrection, by that grace we are called to live with our differences for the sake of God's purpose in Christian community because we're all God's precious children and we're all saved by grace alone. The call and the challenge is that as those whose lives have been touched and claimed by Jesus Christ, now we must be an affirming and inviting people of God, touching and compassionate community of gracious hope who are capable of faithfully reflecting the grace of God as we are learning to walk ever more faithfully with our Lord. Now, that means I may have to think and rethink how I feel about God's grace, especially towards those I perceive as unworthy or hopelessly lost. Our mission is to be a people who show and speak grace into this world. So I think maybe I need to relax and just simply enjoy the truth of God's love 
Our call is to serve with joy and fulfillment and pleasure and not be driven to try to impress or try to earn God's grace. Our call is to celebrate with joy and delight and open fellowship by offering our absolute best in response to God's gracious love and by taking great pleasure in joyfully serving the Lord. Our hope rests not in our religious achievements, our works or our status, but entirely upon the certainty of God's goodness and God's gracious love. As we read in John 3, 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world. Could God have made it any more clear than that? Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, we don't even begin to understand your gracious love, your patience, your goodness and kindness to us. Help us, Lord, to hear and respond and to let that gracious love flow through us out to a world much in need. Guide and bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us join in hymn 316. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.